like to turn off your um, mobile phone if you haven't already. <laughs> welcome. Uh, welcome to our worship today. Um, I'm John Goss and I'm uh, leading the worship and preaching, but I'm very pleased that um, Don Erickson is um, leading communion with the assistance of Julie Connor. Welcome to the third Sunday in Lent. Um, we um, we need to go into the notices now. So you can see that we have Taze prayer services uh, coming on the first Sunday of the month, for the next three months. So that's um, tonight at 6 p.m. An hour of music, reading, silence and meditation open to all. Simon will tell you about a brunch church next week. Communion at Goodwin is tomorrow at 10.30. The Lent study um, on Wednesday afternoon continues, led by Julie Connor. That's been a, a really good group, so you're still welcome to come in, even though it's the third session. And I think that's all. I mean, um, yeah, Simon can tell us about the brunch next Sunday. Hi. Um, three things about the brunch service next week. 9.30 start combined with Holy Cross. Um, because it's a long weekend, we're asking you to please let us know, especially if you know you won't be here. Please let us know. Because it's a long weekend, the potential is for us to have twice as much food as we want mind you we'll probably have that anyway because Kirsty's catering so um, but um, if you want to assist with the food can you please have a chat with Linda because Linda is liaising with with Kirsty about that um, can you please let me know or put your name on the list either definitely coming or definitely not coming um, obviously if you've said you're not coming and things change turn up there'll be there'll be There'll be plenty of food and we would love to see people. Um, thirdly, if anyone has an hour or so available on Saturday afternoon from about 4 or 4.15 just to help set up the church, that, that, that would also be appreciated. Otherwise, we look forward to seeing you next, next Sunday morning for a slightly different worship experience. Roughly, the theme is around joy and sorrow through Lent. Thanks, Simon. Uh, call to worship. God, our Creator, God, our Father and Mother, and God, our Saviour, you are all tenderness and compassion, slow to anger, rich in graciousness, and always ready to forgive. Incline our hearts to your commandments and give us the wisdom of the cross so that freed from the tyranny of self-centeredness we may be open to the gift of your spirit and become living temples of your love, a love that encompasses people of all different types and all living things. Amen. We acknowledge that we meet on the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples and we pay respects to elders past and present. We give thanks for this, their custodianship over the ages since time immemorial of the land that God has given us. And we commit ourselves to also 
um, be carers of this wonderful land. And we commit ourselves also to a journey of justice and reconciliation in company with our First Nations people. We'll now sing together 187, Let All Creation Dance. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the beauty of the dawn, a world waking up as the sun peeps over the horizon, bringing light to a dark world. We thank you for the possibilities of a new day, for the chance to begin afresh. We thank you for the joys of breakfast, and especially that first coffee or tea. We thank you for simple pleasures like a hot shower and clean clothes, pleasures that not everyone in the world gets to enjoy. Forgive us, Lord God, that we keep the good things we enjoy to ourselves when we could sh so easily share more of our blessings with those in need. Gracious God, we thank you for the extraordinary access we have to information about the world and how the world works. Our knowledge of the world is beyond compare to previous generations. We thank you for teachers who transform the huge amount of information available into useful knowledge and wisdom that enables us to live a more fulfilled and useful life with more enjoyment. We thank you for artists and other creatives from all around the world who share their vision of the world around us in all its complexity. We thank you for friends with whom we can share our increased understanding of this beautiful world. Forgive us, Lord God, when we hoard this information and knowledge for our own selfish purposes. Forgive us for being unwilling to share. May we allow the Spirit of God to use this information we have to connect us more closely to other people and this wonderful world. Amen. For the Eco Minute today, um, 
I want to give you some statistics, given that's my background. <laughs> we hear a lot about deaths from violence and wars in the media, but we don't always get the big picture of overall deaths from all different causes. The latest complete data for deaths worldwide we have is for 2019. In 2019, there were 56 million deaths, which is a large number. That's one million deaths a week. A bit, a bit more manageable to understand one million. And of those one million deaths in a week, wait for it, what was the biggest cause of death? <laughs> Not old age. No, no, no. People die of disease and other things. Not not old age. There were the biggest cause of death was high blood pressure. Two hundred and ten thousand deaths out of that one million per week. One hundred and seventy thousand deaths a week were due to tobacco. And 130,000 deaths were due to air pollution, mostly indoor air pollution, actually, um, due to people um, cooking in their own home in, in developing countries. 32,000 deaths were due to unsafe water and sanitation. The things we hear a lot about in the news cause somewhat less deaths. So we have 38,000 deaths a week from excessive hot or cold conditions. We have 23,000 deaths a week from road accidents. 8,000 deaths a week from murders. And 2,400 deaths a week from wars and conflicts. I'm sorry to overwhelm you with all those numbers. I, I should have put it up on the PowerPoint. And there won't be a test afterwards. All I'm trying to say is you won't get a balanced view of risks of dying from listening to the news. It's much better to listen to your doctor or other health professional <laughs> as it's the personal risk to our health, which caused the most deaths. And those risks like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, physical inactivity and smoking are risks we can do something about. Okay, so we will now move to the first set of readings. So Margaret's having to do four readings for us today. I liked all four readings in the lectionary, so we're getting them. <laughs> the first reading is from Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scholar? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since, in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews ask for signs, and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. 
For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. And then extracts from Psalm 19. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the law are sure, making wise the simple. The ordinances of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned, in keeping them there is great reward. But who can detect one's own errors? Clear me from hidden faults. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Thank you, Margaret. We'll now um, stand, if we're able, to sing 356, Here Hangs a Man Dis Discarded. I refer to this hymn by Brian Wren quite a bit in the sermon, so if you listen to the words carefully, it will be Do thanks for the gifts. Um, sorry, um, we um, the free will offering can be given as you exit, or by or electronically. Let us give thanks for these gifts. We thank you for the many gifts, gracious God, that you give to us, and we, as a token of our gratitude, give back with cash and with our other gifts, so that your kingdom may come in greater glory. And let us now um, give each other a sign of the peace. The peace of the Lord be with you.
third reading is from Exodus, and it's actually the Ten Commandments. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labour and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honour your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbour, you shall not covet your neighbour's house, you shall not covet your neighbour's wife, male or female slave, ox, donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbour. Thank you. I think I can read that. Yes, thank you. Um, the fourth and final reading is from uh, the Gospel of John, verse 2, 13 to 22. Jesus cleanses the temple. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables, making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple with the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of there. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. May God help our understanding of all this scripture. Thank you. name of God who is above us, God who is among us, and God who is within us. The readings today focus on two of the three persons of the Godhead, God the Father and God the Son. The Ten Commandments and the reading from the Psalm are about God the Father, God the creator of all laws and all order in the universe. Without the laws that God, the creator, brought into existence, the universe would collapse into total chaos. 
the Ten Commandments are the laws that God set up to bring order to, to our society. And if we followed them religiously, we would have a much more stable and peaceful society. But too often we break the commandments and cause misery to others and to ourselves. And what are we to do when we see others breaking God's commandments? What did Jesus do when he saw the money changers breaking God's commandments in God's temple? And there's no question God's commandments were being broken. The money changers were cheating the common people. So they were breaking the commandments, you shall not steal and you shall not bear false witness. The worst sin against the law of God by the money changers was that their immoral acts were desecrating the holy temple of God. So Jesus had a right to be angry with their sins. But was he right to use violence to cleanse the temple? In making a whip of cords and overturning the money changers at the money changers' temple tables and driving them out of the temple, he was taking the law into his own hands. And his unauthorized violence was breaking the Jewish laws of the Old Testament. God the Father set down the laws and the Jewish people were committed to obeying them. God the Son was breaking those laws. Jesus' action in cleansing the temple with violence was very provocative. What was he trying to achieve? From the time that Jesus triumphantly entered Jerusalem seated on a donkey, cheered on by thousands of people, the people were expecting a rebellious act from Jesus. Most of them wanted Jesus to lead a rebellion against the oppressive Roman Empire, but Jesus did not do that. Instead, he cleansed the temple. And his target here was the Jewish religious leaders, not the Roman authorities. And the Jewish religious leaders were furious with Jesus because they were doing very well out of the money-changing system for sacrifices they had allowed in the temple. And they hated the fact that by cleansing the temple, Jesus highlighted their hypocrisy and greed in supporting a system which cheated the ordinary people in order to give the money lenders and the religious authorities more money. They hated Jesus' cleansing of the temple so much that was the main reason they were prepared to push the Roman authorities to arrest and then execute Jesus. So Jesus' cleansing of the temple was certainly not without consequence. This example shows us there are often very serious consequences or acts of disobedience against religious and state authorities for the sake of standing up for what is right. Many Christians have lost their lives down through the centuries through their acts of disobedience to governments or religious authorities on matters of faith and matters of justice. Martin Luther King lost his life because he fought for justice. Do you know he was thrown into prison 29 times in his battles for civil rights. But once he was put into jail for driving at 30 miles per hour in a 25 miles per hour speed zone in Montgomery, Alabama. He wasn't just fined. He was arrested, fingerprinted, photographed and jailed. 29 times in total put in jail. 
We can admire the courage of people who have stood up to the authority. But is much ever achieved when people who have little power make a stand? Jesus' cleansing of the temple didn't change their immoral practices and led to Jesus being crucified. Paul said that Christ's crucifixion appears as foolishness to the Gentiles. The hymn we sang by Brian Wren says, Here hangs a man discarded, a scarecrow hoisted high, a nonsense pointing nowhere to all who hurry by. Can such a clown of sorrows still bring a useful word? What is the point of sacrifice when it appears that in most cases sacrifice doesn't lead to much real change? How does Christ's sacrifice on the cross make any difference in our daily lives? I think Brian Wren's words capture, capture well the reason for Christ's sacrifice. Wren says, referring to Jesus giving his life for us, that life drained out in bleak distress can share in broken silence my deepest emptiness. Christ's life rained out on the cross and share in broken silence my deepest emptiness. We all have times of deepest emptiness, of feeling hopeless and inadequate, of feeling unworthy and guilty because of the bad things. Christ on the cross is showing his total empathy for the emptiness and unworthiness we feel. He is joining his heart and spirit with ours in our pain and suffering. And he still loves us and values us. Again, as Brian Wren says, the love of Christ has freely entered the pit of our life's despair. He names our hidden darkness and suffers with us there. No God I know of in other religions fully suffers with us in our darkness as Jesus suffers. This is a gift from Christ without price. Because Christ fully understands us and accepts us even in our darkest hidden moments, because of this acceptance, we become one with Christ. And we were, we who were far off from the divine creator of all, are brought into God's family. This is the power of the cross. I don't know how to finish this sermon. At the beginning of the week, I was planning a sermon contrasting God the Father, who is the creator of order and law, and whose prime concern is justice. Contrasting God the Father with God the Son, who out of concern with his people, is prepared to create chaos by breaking the law in a violent cleansing of the temple. And I was 
saying that the son seems more concerned with mercy than justice. And, and I wanted to make the point that in the church we need to have order and disorder, justice and mercy in balance. If we have too much order, we don't allow the freshness of the Spirit of God to blow through the church to create better ways of doing things. And I wanted to make the point that the rigidity of Old Testament law is not able to cope with the messiness and ugliness of our life sometimes. So we need a companion who loves us despite our faults and fully understands us so he can guide us through the darkness. And that person is Jesus. And I have a story about coping with the messiness of life. I went to the funeral last week for Lorna Hayes. It was a wonderful funeral with wonderful eulogies, including one by her daughter, Lisette Hayes, who lives at Rosswalker Lodge. In the eulogies, we heard that Lorna was rather house proud, with a place for everything and everything in its place. She liked to iron the sheets and even the underwear. And when the grandchildren came over, she had each of their favourite treats available, separate boxes for them. And she told the grandchildren not to touch her crystals. When the great-grandchildren started coming over, she started telling them not to touch her crystal. Then it progressed to be to being, be careful with the crystal. And then when the crystal was broken, it was, that's okay. It's not important. Lorna learned to be flexible. 